first grade to meet in the narthex for a children's church time now. For everyone else, we're going to be turning to Ecclesiastes and to continue the sermon series there. But I do want to spend just a couple of minutes addressing in a pastoral way the gut-wrenching experience that probably everybody in this room had in watching an attempted assassination of a presidential candidate. It was a vivid example of, among other things, what theologians call the providence of God. Our confession of faith and catechism speaks about this. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. This means that everything that happens is a display of God's providence. But the way we are wired as human beings means that it is only at certain times that we think about it and we are aware of the providence of God. So what happened early last night was a frightening near miss of a murder and a murder that rises to the, ele to the level of what we call assassination because it was a man speaking in front of a great crowd, perhaps on his way to being elected president of the United States. The assassination was an effort to change the course of history. But just because of the chance, in quotes, angle of former President Trump's head as the bullet went by, the attempt failed. We think that the chance miss so close was by the providence of God. Now, it is good to see God's hand in the events of history. This kind of alarming event makes us realize that God is not remote, but he is involved, and that is a good thing. But an understanding of providence has its limits. One of the great Puritan books about providence is titled The Mystery of Providence. Providence is a mystery in that it doesn't give us any help in interpreting the events. We don't know whether a providential event is a curse or a blessing or what it may mean. Sometimes as history goes on, we begin to get a pretty good idea that maybe it was blessing, maybe it was cursing. But it's very, very difficult to interpret what God might mean by any providential event. You could praise God for the survival of former President Trump, and yet there was an innocent bystander, apparently just one, who was killed. It's a great mystery. We don't understand the ways of providence. And people, even within the church, might have different ways of trying to interpret the event. One person might say that the assassination attempt is a warning, as though God were saying to Mr. Trump, you are a threat to democracy, and if you don't stop, something worse will happen to you. Another person, maybe in the same church or faith tradition, might say, well, God is telling us by this event that Donald Trump is the only one who can save democracy, and that's why his life was spared. See, God does not reveal a meaning to the event. That's a secret. As Pastor Angel read in the Old Testament passage, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to ourselves and to our children. So what do we do with this providential event? Well, be impressed that God is involved in the events of history. 
but be especially thankful that he has spoken in scripture to give meaning to the confusing events of history. And that means patiently searching the scriptures and listening to God. And it takes a lot of sermons and applying those sermons to life to grow in the wisdom that helps us look as wise people upon the events of this world and to know and be thankful that God rules over all things. It is possible to have close fellowship with the God who is active in all the details of the life of this world. And so even though we could say more, we might be tempted to say more about this political event, it's right for us to turn once again, as usual, to God's word as it's laid out for us in the book of Ecclesiastes and to seek his mind there. Would you pray with me as we come to God's word? Our Father, we pray for your blessing upon each one who hears your word this morning. We pray that we would have dealings with you, with our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, you may have well understood by this point that many people have a negative opinion about the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. The most famous line in the book, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, does sound pretty gloomy. But I want to try to make the point, and have been trying to do so week by week, that the dominant emotion created by listening to the preacher is not sadness or depression. If anything, this is a book to lift our spirits, to give us hope, even to make us sing out with confidence and joy. Now, one way to right our wrong opinions about this book is to focus on the beauty of it. And to make that point, I want to change our method a little bit this morning. We've been covering a lot of verses in Ecclesiastes in the last few studies. This morning, I want to slow way down and camp out on one verse. And here it is. And here is our very brief scripture reading, Ecclesiastes 11, 7. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. This verse is exquisitely beautiful. It is poetry crafted with the wonderful Hebrew technique of parallelism. Two lines with the second line echoing the first with slightly different words that provide usually a, a deeper and more interesting line of thought. Light is sweet is the simple first line. And it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun, is the second line. Do you see how the second line does more than just restate the first? With the first line, you are thinking perhaps as light as a general category. As we take this in at first, we might not know how we should be thinking about light. Maybe it's the headlights of a car, or maybe it's light from a single candle in a dark room, light from the moon and the stars, maybe the light shining down on Citizens Bank Park at a night game for the Phillies. The second line tells us to think about the light from the sun, and it brings into view parts of the body that take in the light, our eyes. Now, what impressions do these words make on you? We usually use the word sweet to describe something that we taste, and the Bible does this as well. This time of the year, I think of how refreshing a watermelon is 
when it's perfectly ripe, chilled, just right, to bring refreshment, it's nature's candy that is sweet to the taste. You can also think of the sweetness of a person. We have four granddaughters. They are sweet girls. And yet at the same time, our grandsons are pretty great also. And each of them has at least little nuggets of sweetness alongside their dominant, rowdy aggressiveness. And we should think of one of the great characters of scripture, the greatest type of Christ, David, the son of Jesse, the man who was raised on high, 2 Samuel 23, 1 says, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David's psalms deliver to us the sweetness that God has built up in his heart. We also use the word to describe fellowship with people that is deeply satisfying. David had the experience of a close friend betraying him, and the pain of that betrayal was all the worse when he thought of their past friendship. In Psalm 55, he writes, we used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. There is nothing so sweet or pleasant than the experience of closeness to another person. That rich fellowship with people creates a sweetness in the soul. That is the deepest part of who we are. Sweetness in the soul is what Ecclesiastes 11.7 is really all about. You see it elsewhere in Solomon's Proverbs, if the wisdom of God enters your soul, you will find a sweetness inside. Proverbs 3.24 says, if you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. And we've been focusing on the word sweet, but let's not forget the parallel word in the second line that is like it, pleasant. When Jeremiah was given a vision of what God would do after the severe judgment upon Israel and Judah, he was given words of vision, and he says this, he writes about it, for God says, I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish, Jeremiah 31, 25. That was a vision Jeremiah had from God in the night. And then he tells us what it felt like. At this I woke and looked, and my sleep was pleasant to me. The sermon this morning is for everyone who needs some light in their soul. If you have come here this morning as a visitor and are just checking out this church and maybe the Christian faith itself, I want to tell you that this sermon is especially for you. Light is sweet and it is pleasant to the eyes to, to see the sun is a statement meant to draw you to God. There are times in scripture in his word that God uses his law to expose our guilt and shame. And then we are invited to come and have God wash away the dirt of our souls. And that's an important part of coming to him. But there are times when the word of God is used to draw people by the sheer attraction of the beauty of the Lord. And this is one of those places in scripture. There is a novel that I'm told is great, but I've been unable to penetrate it, except for a line or two. It's William Faulkner's Light in August. I love the title. It helps me understand a little bit Ecclesiastes 11.7. Now here's what one teacher wrote about why Faulkner gave his novel this intriguing title. 
main character, Reverend Hightower, sits at his window before the sun begins to set and marvels at, and here's what Faulkner actually wrote, how that fading copper light would seem almost audible, like a dying yellow fall of trumpets, dying into an interval of silence and waiting. Did you catch that? The light at the end of the day in August had a color of copper that light seemed to be saying something like soft notes from a trumpet fading as the daylight runs out. Those trumpets seem to introduce something deeper, a message that we would wait for with eagerness. And that gives you the idea of sweetness and pleasantness felt deep inside when it's the impressions of God, the God of light, grace and love who draws near to a person and lifts up their heart. Now we've been already using other parts of scripture to help us appreciate Ecclesiastes 11.7. Now I want to continue to do that and explore in a rather wide way how the Bible can open up the meaning of this one verse, and we'll do it in three steps. First of all, saying that light is relational, or seeing light is relational. Now this is something that might be so obvious that we will skip over it. This is how relational this text is. Light is sweet and it is pleasant to the eyes to see the sun. Notice it's the eyes of a person that are in view in this passage. A person has to be there to see the light. It's no good just talking about it in abstraction. Somebody has to take it in and be moved by it. And this is at the very heart of our identity as human beings, that we are people who see. Now let's turn in our Bibles and go back to the very beginning, to Genesis chapter 1. There in verse 3 we read, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Light was made by God. But God saw the light. He responded to it with appreciation. The light was good. It would not be a stretch to read this as the light was sweet. God leads the way in feeling the goodness of the light and the pleasantness to the eyes. God not only creates, God sees what he creates. He takes it in and he responds to it with pleasure. And then God shows this quality of relationship now in verse 26 in Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice God takes counsel within himself. Later revelation in scripture make it clear that this is because God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are three persons in the Godhead. The three persons take counsel together. They think about it. They talk about it. They are in communion with one another. They know the sweetness of fellowship together. And God makes man in his image. Now we could take a lot of sermons to explain all that is meant by man in the image of God. But for our text this morning, it's enough to say that man is a person who sees in some way as God sees. Man is able to see the light, to appreciate the light, to know that it is sweet. God then is sharing the experience of being someone who sees. 
Now I want you to think of your own personal experience of seeing beautiful light and loving it and being moved by it. We all have our own unique experiences, I think. This is something that's very personal. And I want you to think about the richest, sweetest sensation of light that you have ever known. Now here's what God says. This is given to help you relate to God. God made you to be a person like him, able to see and reflect and appreciate. Who are we anyway as human beings? We are made in the image of God. We share the experience of pleasure in the light that God has made. This is how we relate to God. Now secondly, let's think about light as coming from creation. You've gotten a head started on that already in Genesis 1, but now turn over with me to Psalm 19. And I'll read the first few verses of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. There is no escaping the voice of God in the light from the sun and the moon and the stars, the clouds, the heavens are communicating something to everyone who lives under the heavens. And there's no translation necessary. The message is clear to every person, no matter what their language. This revelation from God, like music, is a universal language. Everybody who lives on the earth gets the same message and perfectly understands it. And what is the message? God is a God of glory. The beauty and artistry of God is seen in what he has made. God is beauty itself. He's the source of all beauty, all excellence, but also all weight and significance, what is important and lasting and of value. That is God, the glory of God. And it's intensely personal. David, the sweet psalmist, uses a brilliant poetic image to describe what he feels when he watches the sunrise. Well, it's like a wedding day. And the bridegroom is in his tent waiting for the morning. As the sun begins to, to rise, it's like the day of the wedding has begun and the bridegroom emerges from his tent. That's what he sees when the sun begins to poke itself up in the east, shining in brightness as he comes out. And now his day is underway. He keeps rising. It's as though he was running a race, like Olympic athletes rejoicing in the strength of the race they run. It's as though David thinks of the sun moving through the sky as Eric Little, you know, the chariots of fire character who understood that God made him fast. And so when he ran, he felt God's pleasure in doing what God made him to do. It's joy, it's pleasure. David looks at the sun and he sees, that's what I feel inside. I feel pleasure and joy, energy and strength by the revelation of God that is all around me. Now, if, if all this is true, 
Why don't we all feel more sweetness in our souls? Why is depression so rampant? Why are people racked with anxiety and worry? Why would some people here this morning feel a huge sense of missing something as they hear these words about what the Bible says of the universal message of God's glory in, in creation? Why doesn't everybody see it? So at this point, we have to go a little bit negative. And to do that, I'd ask you to turn over to Romans chapter 1. This is the one interruption in a message that I'm trying to craft with all sweetness and light. Maybe it's just my disposition, but I can't get away from darkness and trouble and wrong. Let's look at Romans 1, verses 18 through 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This passage is saying exactly what Psalm 19 says. The creation speaks eloquently about God's glory so that nobody can miss it. But this passage tells us something tragic. We don't want to know God or honor him and give him thanks. We don't like the automatic message coming through that we are creatures made by a creator who rightly demands that we bow before him. We don't want to bow down before God. We want to put ourselves at the center of life. We'd like God to bow down to us, if anything. We want God to comply with our expectations and demands about what God ought to be like. We suppress the truth. We hold it down. That beautiful truth of the glory of God shining in all that he has made rubs us the wrong way. We try to tamp it down so that we can preserve our independence and keep calling all the shots in life. But this suppressing the truth takes a toll. We keep holding it down and holding it down and gradually the light goes just about out. We end up with hearts that are foolish and dark. And that's why we are depressed and anxious. So there is something of God's law in our sermon this morning meant to draw us to him. You could say the demand to give thanks is there in Romans 1. We should all be people who respond to God with a life of thanksgiving from the depths of our souls. And we are guilty for not living in this way. And that is why the light with all its sweetness fails to lift our hearts. But light also comes from redemption, and that's our last point. There is an answer to this desperate problem. The answer is God's work of redemption. We miss the light of God in creation because we are fallen into sin. But God shines his light in this work of redemption, and so there is hope for us. Maybe you have wondered at some point during the sermon, with all the emphasis on seeing, what about people who are blind? And this is a good question. And there is a story in John's Gospel 
that speaks of just this thing. And now a final passage that I want us to look at is John 9 and verses 1 through 7. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, who was born blind? See, the disciples are entering into some, theologi some theological work here. They acknowledge sin is in the world, and sin is what makes horrible things like blindness, and it must therefore stem from some specific sin. Who committed it? This man? How would that be? If he was born blind, when did he have a chance to sin and be punished? Or his parents, maybe. Maybe they sinned, and so the punishment is leveled out on this son. So they bring this question to Jesus, and he answers, it was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work all the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Here's a case of great human suffering. A man who has never seen anything. Light is sweet, Ecclesiastes tells us. And here's a man who never knew that sweetness. The disciples try to figure it out. What they bring to Jesus is what we would call toxic theology. He corrects them as the greatest theologian who ever lived, not denying the reality of sin, but denying that you can draw a direct line from one specific sin to this man's suffering. But an even more revolutionary word from Jesus, this man's suffering will be used to show the glory of God. How? By redemption. Jesus healed this poor man. It was a sign, one of seven signs in John's gospel. And the signs all pointed to who Jesus was, the savior of the world, and what he would do, lift the curse and bring in a new world. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God. His suffering and death, even the death of the cross, paid the penalty and gave him the right to make all things new again. He will make a new heaven and a new earth where the blind see and the lame walk. So a question for you this morning. Have you heard that Jesus calls you to come to him? Have you ever sensed his life-giving offer to take you in? You know whether this has happened. You can't mistake it or miss it. You also know if you are missing out on this. Life is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. If you are suffering through a lot of darkness in your days, you should be open to hearing from Jesus this morning. Remember that novel by Faulkner called Light in August. Here's something interesting about that book and the people who come to life in it. We should also let you know that Light in August was originally titled Dark House. And three of the major characters, Joanna Burden, Gail Hightower, and Joe Christmas, are frequently depicted sitting in darkness. We say that's a pretty appropriate image for characters that are trapped in the past and in their own egos. 
unable to experience enlightenment and insight. Jesus offers you new life. Jesus can lift people like us out of darkness. He opens the door, leads us out of the trap of our own egos and the past that can haunt us. How can you know the sweetness of the light of Christ? By believing in him. You do that best right where you are this morning. No need to do anything. You're listening to his word, unable to do any good works that might somehow lead you to think it's those good works that are pleasing God and drawing you to him. No, you sit and listen to Jesus call, tell him in your heart that you are tired of walking in darkness and asking him to shine his light on you. And that's what he delights to do. One more word written by the Apostle Paul that can be true of you and me from 2 Corinthians 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is God's offer to everybody who hears these words. May each of us respond in faith. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would draw near to us through your life-giving and light-giving word. Through Jesus the Lord, we pray. Amen.